Hi, I'm Tracy kajewski Correa. I'm happy to provide this video on behalf of the Structural Extreme Events Reconnaissance Network. We're based out of the United States and funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation. Um, we officially came into being in 2017 under what's called an Eager Rapid Award. That was just a, a soft launch type of grant. And we've recently been extended with our next round of funding to expand our capabilities. So we will be in our kind of version 2.0 of STEER that just started uh, last month, actually, for the next three years. So just a little bit of a background on STEER. Um, we were launched to focus on deepening three dimensions of the natural hazards engineering community, particularly in the United States, though our membership does span globally. Uh, the first is to increase the capacity of that community um, by creating data standards, best practices, and offering training um, to promote better field reconnaissance. Also then uh, to coordinate during the, um, you know, the aftermath of one of these events so that we can have early, very efficient, and hopefully impactful responses, uh, coordinating with other bodies also funded by NSF and beyond. And then the idea of encouraging collaboration. We wanted to find ways to help researchers connect with one another to do this work, but also to engage their colleagues who are in practice and even policymakers, because one of our ultimate goals is to see the data we generate from these events ultimately accelerate the recovery process or at minimum the learning from these events so that we can prevent losses in the future. So when STEER goes out to um, respond to a mission, we have two primary outcomes. The first I would say is, is focusing on communal data. All of our data is open and is shared with the community widely. Its goal is to create a, um, a sampling or representative um, demonstration of how the structures in those events performed. Um, and then we're hoping that that data serves a broad range of reuses by both our members as well as those in other organizations. And we also offer synthesis documents in the forms of reports and briefings that share the knowledge that we generated in the event to wide audiences. Um, in terms of the way we organize our membership, our membership is, is you know, developed into a, a, a system level one through four. And the reason we structure it in this way is we wanna help to build up the capacity of our members in learning how to operate within STEER system. And we know that some of our members are very new to reconnaissance. So um, when members apply, they are assessed and assigned one of four levels. At level one, not much experience, they'll begin their work with STEER as part of our virtual assessment structural teams, what we call the VAST team. As they build up capacity, they can be promoted up to level two. Um, at which point they're qualified to deploy in the field for the first time on a field assessment structural team as what we'd call a trainee. At level three, our more seasoned members with some field experience um, eventually are kind of elevating up and taking over some of our working groups. And then eventually at level four, our highest level, these individuals are qualified um, to lead um, missions as one of our FAST leaders, and they even contribute to some of our leadership and governance activities. So when people apply, they are put into one of these four levels and those at the lowest levels are reevaluated annually so that they can work their way up to eventually, hopefully achieving a level four status. Currently we have over 300 people who've applied and been approved as members of STEER. And we've had over almost about half of those individuals or a little bit more actually respond to events during our three years of existence. And we have over 380 persons actively using our mobile applications. In terms of the way STEER structures its event responses, we will look at an event and decide if we will have response at one of three levels. A tier one response is a major hazard event that doesn't have the potential to generate new knowledge, so we will not form teams, a virtual or field, but we will issue an event briefing just to reiterate key lessons on, or points that we wanna make about the event. A tier two is more often the case, and that's when we see an event that does have the potential to generate knowledge. In this case, we'd be activating our virtual assessment structural team, and they would be issuing as a result of looking at publicly available information, including social media and news reports, a preliminary virtual reconnaissance report. We call that the PVRR. If that report um, suggests that we're gonna be needing field data collection, and sometimes that's evident very early on, we will elevate to tier three and that's an event where we think there is, you know, definitely some knowledge to be generated and we will have our virtual team now be flanked by a field assessment structural team, a FAST. That FAST team will go out and collect data. 
That data will inform a early access reconnaissance report, an EARR, that gives high level impressions from the field team. And then eventually that data, once it completes a quality control process, will be issued as a curated data set. To give you an idea of the timeline, especially when we go to this tier three response, you can see that at the bottom of the slide, we would have an event. The virtual team usually will then activate at minimum on a tier two or a tier three. They'll start compiling data and write that preliminary report. That's going to be released and we often shoot to get that out within a week. That's not always possible, but we love that to be very soon after the event. The field team will try to deploy as quickly as they can. Um, sometimes we've been in the field the same day a hurricane hits, for example, because we can pre-stage our response. But that team will then respond and the FAST will take over in data collection. Our virtual team will then continue to support from the backside. They'll be looking at the data that's coming in on our mobile apps, for example, and they're gonna help the FAST to author the early access reconnaissance report. So our virtual teams play a pivotal role, not, in the, not only at the first phase when that preliminary report is generated, but definitely in, in evaluating the data that's coming in, even from those who are in the field. So, you know, within a few weeks, you'll see that early access reconnaissance report come out. That's usually going to be a few weeks after the field team concludes data collection. And then we have a period that can stretch on actually for a few months, depending on the size of the data set, where our data librarians are actually enacting a quality control and enrichment process. They are bringing additional data sources in, as I'll talk about a little bit later in the video, and they're checking and quality assuring all the data to make sure it's to our standard and then it's going to be issued as a curated um, data set. So that's kind of the, the way we respond and the way we use our different uh, team members for these different phases. So with respect to the kinds of missions that we execute, we actually do have a, a few different mission design options, and I tried to lay them out in this, um, this slide here to just overview them briefly for you. When we have, um, we have one mission design that's a hazard gradient survey, you see this in the um, first column in the top row, this is an instance where we have a good appreciation of the hazard intensity and how it varies geospatially. So we will actually select targets and design the mission to move along that gradient and conduct performance assessments um, you know, as we move across the variances in, in hazard intensity. This is a helpful mission design, especially for when we want to try to generate um, fragilities, for example, uh, to, to capture building performance. If we have an instance where we're going into an international setting that's quite challenging and we don't have much time on the ground, we may switch to a representative performance um, study. That's what we did in the Palu tsunami. Um, in that case, we're getting on the ground and finding a way to document representative structures, not a large sample, but just representative performance on a wide variety of structures. And that might inform subsequent rounds of follow-up reconnaissance. That certainly was the case when we moved into Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas. That was a phased multi-hazard investigation. It's the last one in the first column here. And that's an instance where a field team went in, did representative performance study. That informed the um, operationalization of a larger team across multiple islands, where we were bringing in experts in coastal storm surge mapping as well as structural performance. So multi-hazard investigations phased with different disciplines sometimes involved. When we move then to the other side of this um, picture, an, another um, example of the hazard gradient survey I, I provided to on this slide was the Nashville tornadoes. Just to demonstrate that we can work across the gradient in a hurricane, as we did in Hurricane Michael, and we can certainly do so in tornadoes as well as earthquakes. So these gradient surveys are one of our primary ways of responding. In cases where we have earthquakes, particularly when there's an earthquake that happens um, in locales that aren't frequently affected, it may warrant more in-depth case study based um, documentation with extensive photo documentation and pictures. It's certainly when the Puerto Rico earthquakes hit, that was the approach we took. And that you know, comes out with a very different form of data set, not a large sample, but very deep sample where case study buildings are explored in, in great rigor with um, extensive photo documentation and analysis. And then we have our rapid surveys with virtual assessment. This is a model we're starting to use more and more. Um, we're using this model actively right now in Haiti for the 2021 earthquake. But we actually started it during the pandemic, uh, during Hurricane Laura, simply to create a way to get into communities without um, putting people at risk to COVID. 
So we will actually use a lot of our imaging techniques to collect data with very few humans involved in the field, but then a large army of humans virtually participating to review the records and assign damage ratings. So as I mentioned, our apps are a primary part of our arsenal and steer. We work in the Fulcrum platform currently, and our Fulcrum app has a number of nice features that gives us a single geolocated record for every assessment that contains a lot of rich data. So in our app, we have a very robust cross section of standardized data fields that will capture everything that we would need to know about the building and its structural attributes and its different materials and components and a lot of component damage rating that gives us a nice um, objective rating uh, of damage that can feed into then global damage and functionality ratings. The app will capture photography, um, the photographs, as well as audio files to dictate additional notes. Um, it has a way to type in additional text and you can even embed video. So in a single map pin, as you can see here on the mobile app, within that single pin is a rich array of information that's all then managed in a backside cloud-based um, cloud database that can export it out to all sorts of common formats like GeoJSON, shapefiles, et cetera. So it's a very nice platform, very robust, and you can build custom apps and have a, a really nice and rigorous data management uh, workflow. What Fulcrum also allows us to do is actually set up our pre-deployment mission design and integrate it within Fulcrum. So we can set up targets um, geospatially for our teams to find polygons or particular structures of interest, as shown here in this example for uh, the Bahamas, for Dorian. And then once we sample across a diversity of structural typologies and hazard intensities and building characteristics and design that sample, we can actually upload that sample map as a layer in Fulcrum so when the field team is out, they can look in their map and navigate toward the structures of interest or the polygons that we've identified, giving a nice seamless connection between the virtual team supporting the mission remotely and the field team interrogating the app to find out where they should go to conduct assessments. And then we share that knowledge out widely with the community. Everything that we have is open. So our data is open on Fulcrum for anyone to access and use. Our Street View imagery goes into Google, Google Maps and Mapillary for um, wide use right after the event. And all of our data and reports are curated and design safe and circulated with a full DOI. Finally, let me talk about the limitations of the approach that we um, have taken as STEER. I see three areas that we have seen challenges in our approach. The first is the extractive nature of what we do. We go into communities when they are most affected and extract from them, but we don't always find a way to come full circle and bring that back. So what we are looking at now are less intrusive methods, using more of those imaging platforms that are light touch and have very few humans coming into the affected area. We are focusing more on using our regional teams to come in without tying up hotels and rental cars, which are in vital need after a major event. And we're looking at ways to engage local communities and feeding back what we learn. So we're not just extracting from them, but we're doing so in a way that gives immediate knowledge back to them to assist with recovery. So we're working on getting better there. Our methodologies, especially because of the quality control process and the standards we have for our products are very time and labor intensive. So we're working now to understand better how to shape the, the expectations around our different products based on the level of response that we're delivering in a given event. We're also working to build up more automated processing of the data and damage detection algorithms. And of course, we also need staffing. So we have added some full-time staffing, if you will, to support us in the form of postdocs to help manage the workflow. And finally, with respect to standards, you know, one of the goals here is to have quality assured data to a high standard that the community can then use and reuse and know consistently from event to event that STEER data is gonna have the following form and level of quality. And that's hard to do when we have ad hoc teams. Like I said, 150 plus members have jumped onto teams and formed rapidly after an event to work together for a few weeks and then you know, break apart. And so it's hard to manage those teams and get that quality control. So we've been incorporating quality control and standards enforcement on the backside but of course, doing it better on the front end would mean less work on the back end to enforce and clean up any missteps. As a result, I think we really do need to focus on building the capacity of our members to be able to work on those ad hoc teams and produce even higher quality work um, that will require minimal amounts of additional quality controlling afterward. But of course, 
that's a learning process when developing a very dynamic collaboration model. So thank you. I look forward to sharing more about STEER and learning from all of you at the workshop.